we are now going to welcome to the studios Dr. Eric Seward, OBGYN at Woodlawn Hospital for Doc Talk. Good morning, sir. How are you? Good morning. I'm great. Thank you. Why, uh, what do we got going on in the medical world? What are we talking about today? Well, we were going to talk about ovarian cysts. Um, this is a topic that comes up almost daily in my world and probably never comes up in yours. <laughs> no. <laughs> but uh, a, lot of, a lot of our patients um, are either dealing with or have heard these terms. Um, and I, I'm going to start by just saying a cyst is nothing more than a bubble inside of somebody. Um, a lot of cysts happen on kidneys, livers, and lungs, uh, on bones. There's, you know, top they of your happen. Head. In I, had almost one I had one taken off the top of my head, yeah. Okay. And um, all of those, uh, well, with maybe the exception of the one on your head, most of those are, are <laughs> formed from, basically, from development. Uh, so when a kidney comes together, if there's a little bubble that gets in there, then that's just, it's there for life. Um, with with the one on on as you get sort of towards the exterior so um different skin conditions uh, those may be coming and going sorts of of cysts depending on what it was um in the case of the ovaries ovaries make cysts and this is actually their their job in life uh they they basically are designed to produce an egg um every month um you go through this process of recruiting about 15 or maybe 20 eggs, of which one of them has more follicle-stimulating and, and luteinizing hormone receptors. Uh, these are signals from the brain. The one that has the, the, the most responsiveness ends up developing, and it forms into a follicle. And so if you take anybody that's you know essentially between the ages of 14 and maybe you know 45 or 50, um, and you were to do an ultrasound, every month you would see a cyst form. Those are what we call follicles or follicular cysts. They're normal. They get up to about two and a half, maybe three centimeters in size. They tend to be simple appearing. Once in a while, they may bleed and cause some aches or pains. They may uh, develop some complexities based on that. Um, then they, they start to disappear. As they, as they disappear, um, they're oftentimes called corpus luteums. These are the progesterone-producing parts of the follicle. And ultimately, they take a few months to completely disappear off the radar. Um, in the case of, of other forms of cysts, and most of the problems that arise in the ovaries... Um, do show up as some kind of a cyst. Uh, they can form either as a result of tumors, as a result of ovulation gone haywire. Um, one of the more common uh, conditions that people come into my office with uh, either pre-diagnosed or, or things that we're considering is something called polycystic ovarian syndrome, of which there are a number of cysts that form basically the function of anovulation. And, uh, and so these are very common, common things to run into. And I think there's a, a common misperception out there of what exactly cysts represent, which cysts are, are worrisome, which cysts are things that we uh, as doctors would want to do something about uh, versus uh, simply just watch versus basically normal physiology. Um, it's not unusual for somebody to come in with an ache or a pain to the emergency room, get some kind of imaging, maybe a CAT scan, uh, ultimately be diagnosed with a cyst sometime on the opposite side of where the aches or pains were. Uh, but I, I think there's this, this sort of compulsion then to send them in to see a specialist to see if the cyst is anything to worry about. And a lot of times, you know, it's it's this this whole explanation of, of normal physiological processes that that I end up uh, dealing with. Sometimes normal cysts can cause pain. There's a, a condition called middle schmerz. We were just talking about French uh, words. Well, um, this, in this particular case, uh, it's a German word. Middle schmerz means pain in the middle of the month, basically. And it's, uh, it's those who actually feel ovulation, uh, which, which isn't typical, but, but there are some people that can feel literally when an egg is released. And, um, and there's just sort of a mini explosion that happens, and, and people can sometimes feel that. It can kind of give you a, uh, sometimes a fairly severe pain for a, an hour or two, maybe even a day, and then it goes away. And, and if that happens every single cycle, you can kind of, you can kind of uh, diagnose that based on when it's happening. 
Um, but that's not very typical. Um, more of the time when we're dealing with cysts that have created problems, we're dealing with cysts that either failed to ovulate, so they, they went beyond their two and a half or three centimeters and just grew and grew and grew, or perhaps they bled into their core instead of, of ovulating normally, they bled into themselves and developed a blood clot within the cyst. Um, or uh, it, sometimes they do represent tumors. And, and there, there are some hallmark things that you can look at within a cyst to tell whether or not it might be riskier. Also putting it into context with what's going on with the patient and who the patient is. If it's a 20 year old, who comes in with a four and a half centimeter complex cyst is probably not cancer. But that same, you know, scenario um, in a, a 55 year old might be. And so, you know, you have to kind of put things into context as to how we follow up on, on them. Um, probably one of the better, you know, everybody hears these terms, CAT scans and MRIs and, and ultrasounds. Anybody that's gone through a uh, any kind of uh, of an exam like that, a CAT scan or an MRI especially, those are, uh, a lot of people will describe them as claustrophobic and, and things that sort of drive them uh, crazy to, to go in. There's some clanking and whatnot. And they make beautiful images. MRIs in particular make beautiful images of like joints and bones. And oftentimes the orthopedic surgeons will use um, MRIs predominantly um, CAT scans are great at looking at internal organs, and you can do them with or without dye. All of them can pick up ovarian cysts, but none of them are great at it. Ultrasounds tend to be the very best. Um, ultrasounds do produce fairly fuzzy pictures of a lot of things, but they, they're great at picking out these fluid-filled areas. And so when it comes to cysts and sort of uh, initial screening tests for cysts, most of the time that's what we ultimately are doing. And so a lot of people will come in and they'll, they'll wonder why they had an MRI in the ER or they had a CAT scan and now we're ordering an ultrasound. That's, that's really to clarify exactly what it is we're looking at, exactly how big it is. Those tests just uh, kind of where the ovary lies and the fact that ovaries are fairly mobile. Um, it, you may not you may not see it in the same place exactly every time and cysts sometimes are a little hard to differentiate between maybe a tube and a, an ovary and a, and a uterus itself. Uh, so a lot of times we're using ultrasounds. There are, as I oftentimes discuss with our patients, there are three things that, that make me concerned about a cyst. One is if they're large and we, we use sort of an age-based graded scale. Uh, when somebody's fairly young, uh, most doctors use seven or eight centimeters as, as sort of the point at which things are big um, enough to maybe warrant doing something about. Um, it, when you get to be postmenopausal, we're thinking more five, six centimeters, just, just because at that point you're not ovulating. And uh, while some cysts can be kind of chronic and can have perhaps been there for years, you don't want to sit around in a, a, a situation that's got a little bit higher risk for, for basically being something that needs to be addressed. Um, the second thing that I always look at is complexity. Uh, most of the times when we get an ultrasound report back, we will get, there's, there are certain phrases that are used, but um, simple versus complex. Um, just like it sounds, a simple cyst is just a, a simple round bubble. Um, it's usually fairly clear, uh, doesn't have any of the, the normal junk or stuff in it. Um, whereas complex cysts have sometimes septations and other things. Now, again, in a younger patient, these usually represent hemorrhagic cysts. But there are a bunch of different scenarios. Some, some of them are benign, some of them aren't where complex cysts can be things that are a little bit more either involved or worrisome um, from, we, we see these really kind of interesting, now we're jumping from, uh, from German to Greek, but um, we see these things that are, that are called teratomas. Teratomas, uh, just like they sound, uh, or the word is terrible tumor, basically. And a teratoma is, um, these are really funky little cysts that form that, derive out of some of the germ tissue. Um, most of the time they're benign, like on the order of 999 out of 1,000. 
Um, but they, they tend to develop along a different cell line. And sometimes they develop things like hair, teeth, um, just goo that, that's sort of reminiscent of like snot, basically. Um, we've seen them with thyroid tissue in them. The ones with teeth are the, are the really strange ones. Um, this or, is a cyst that has yep. grown teeth. Yes, yes. Yeah, and a, a real funny story. I had this guy named Dr. Galster who was one of my, uh, one of my um, mentors, I guess, in residency. He was, he was an older doc, and he literally took, he had a tooth that he had pulled that had a gold filling, and he stuck it in one of these and sent it to the pathologist as a joke. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I don't know if I don't you know I think he was one of those guys that only he could ever get away with that but <laughs> but he, he um yeah they they are they're kind of interesting things uh, most of the time frequently they have hair uh, that seems to be like the 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 path that a lot of these cells but if you think about it an ovary is producing eggs right um, eggs are are germ cells germ cells basically have potential to go on and become a whole person and and so they certainly have the potential to differentiate into different parts of a person and when you think about think about the ovary it's a pretty complex organ that's built for developing storing uh, eggs basically and these these germ cells and these multi-potential cells that surround them um, that have the ability to go on and become you know lo lots of different any organ in your body um, they they can sometimes just go haywire and mm -hmm. develop uh, abnormally um this is not a super common thing but i would say in any given year i'll run into a couple of these uh, sometimes by accident sometimes it's something that's that's picked up on ultrasound um because they do they they look like complex cysts with you know shadows from bony structures and hair and 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 whatnot um so you can, you know, you can see, and then as you get into sort of bigger, more complex cysts with more septations and more stuff in the middle, you start to worry more about tumors. Um, some of them are benign. Some of them are what we call borderline tumors, and some of them are, are honest to goodness, cancers. Um, and, and it's not always real simple to tell. We, we have a few blood markers. Probably the best known one is CA125, which is a blood marker that's pretty specific for... Um, epithelial cells on ovaries, which is what most ovarian cancers come from. So if you see a complex cyst and you do a CA125 and the CA125 comes back fairly high, that's a pretty good indicator that you might be dealing with the cancer. On the other hand, if it comes back normal, it's a pretty good indicator that you probably aren't dealing with at least the most common kinds of cancer. Um, and, and so that's that's one way to kind of ferret these things out a little bit. Um, very, uh, very interesting stuff. Um, I think that with regards to, um, you know, my common patients that come in, the vast majority of them don't have ovarian cancers. Um, obviously, the ones that do, we want to pick up on as soon as possible and get them into more advanced treatments and give them the best chance they have to, to kind of nip that in the bud early. Um, ovarian cancers are probably the biggest bane of, of my world just because they're very difficult, kind of like pancreatic cancers. They, they, they show up late, um, partly because of where they are. They're just very internal, partly because the symptoms are things like bloating and, you know, just not very nonspecific things. That, right. I, I, I like to point out that it's, it's the exact same symptoms you would have if you ate a burrito. You know, it's just all the, you know... But there's a, <clears throat> and they've argued about it so much, I can't remember, I don't know what it is right now, but there's a certain age where they say you ought to start getting uh, mammograms on a regular basis. Is there a certain age where you should start getting that blood test you were just talking about? Well, here's the problem. It's not a great screening test because it doesn't really predict anything. What it's better at is sort of, again, differentiating those complex cysts from benign. From, okay. from, and, and even then, you have to kind of, you have to interpret it a little bit. Um, there's a, a different kind of cyst entirely called an endometrioma. Endometriomas are endometriosis that form on an ovary. And an endometrioma, um, sometimes they're called chocolate cysts because they look like they've, they're filled with chocolate syrup. They can raise uh, CA125 levels um, to a degree simply because they're irritating the surface of the ovary. 
And uh, so a lot of times, um, I think in our lab here, the CA125 number is 35 or maybe 40 as the normal cutoff. So anything less than that is, is normal. A lot of times with my CA 125s of like 60 or 70 or 80, that that's probably a benign tumor like a, an endometrioma um, or a super early cancer. Um, when they're 300 or 400, they're almost always cancers. You know, so it's there's sort of a little bit of interpretation. You also have to look at the patient. Not too many 25 year olds have epithelial tumors of their ovaries. Lots of them have endometriomas. Um, so it's it. It, it, you kind of have to do a little bit of interpretation with that. But the key is figuring it out as soon as possible and getting people into treatment. So, the, you know, the thing number two, you know, the first one was size. The second one is complexity um, in terms of decision making. And the third thing is, you know, I'm always going to take a cyst serious if I've got a patient sitting there holding their side going, ouch, ouch, ouch. Um, you know, it's sort of a, a quality of life issue. And when people have a cyst, there's a small chance that it could twist or torse or, or cause extra pain or problems. And with that in mind, it's, you know, it's, um, it, it's important to kind of jump on those things a little bit quicker. Um, a lot of people will be walking around. In fact, I, I, I often use the example of if I grab the first hundred people off of, you know, Main Street in Rochester, walking in and I did ultrasounds on all of them um, and, and you know the caveat being that they're all 25 years old might take a while to get that study done on Main Street in Rochester but yeah. if um, if you did that um, you would find that a ton the majority would have cysts there on the ovaries and the question then is you know they didn't know it so so you know am I going to do anything about that Probably not. You know, that's, those are probably normal follicular cysts unless they have these components of complexity, which most of the time we're not just randomly doing CA-125 tests. We are getting to the point, and I think that the future of medicine probably will uh, show this. Um, we're getting to the point where we can map genetics. <clears throat> we can get our genetic... Um, portfolio, if you will, and we can look at it and see where the risks are for genetic problems. Most of the um, ovarian cancers that happen are what we call multifactorial and they're random. Uh, they happen, you know, we don't really know why they happen. They, there is a, a genetic uh, trend to some ovarian cancers and they're actually related to breast cancers. They're related to um, the BRCA genes that that we all ultimately test a lot of and people that have strong family histories. And ovarian cancer is on that. But the vast majority of ovarian cancers are not BRCA related. Most of them just sort of spontaneously occur. And whether they occur in clusters and families, um, which lends one to think maybe there's something else connected, um, or whether they're just you know sort of the random spontaneous cancer, Ovarian cancers rank fourth or fifth on the most common uh, female cancers, so they're not super common. They're they're somewhere between one and two percent um, of the population. the The problem with them is they are they're a little more mean and, and a little more difficult to to treat because they tend to show up at stage at higher stages, stage three, stage four. Um, most of them show up as stage threes just sort of based on how they spread. So ovarian uh, cancer screening is not, you know, it's not something that we have great um, ways to do. And people that have a super high risk, a lot of times we'll, we'll bring them in and do, you know, maybe yearly or every six month um, ultrasounds. That's probably better than a CA-125. In some people that have super strong family histories, we may do both um, just because we want to catch anything and everything super early and in cases where people have super strong family histories or uh, sort of a, a concurrent breast cancer or sometimes just if they have a breast cancer that's estrogen positive we may go in and take the ovaries out you know at the it's always a balancing act of not creating menopause too early but at the same time you know uh, decreasing the risk or aiding the treatment of cancer um, but that's that, those are fairly um, extraordinary 
circumstances. You, you hear about celebrities every once in a while, Angelina Jolie, I think, and a few others that just went and had uh, had mastectomies because they've got real strong family histories. That does come up periodically, um, but it's not, you know, it's not typical. Okay. Again, speaking with Dr. Eric Seward, OBGYN at Woodlawn Hospital for Doc Talk. Doc, do we have anything else we need to go over right now? Well, no, I just, you know, I, I put this one on the list. It's it's one of the more arcane things to the non, um, if you have a cyst, <laughs> you know exactly what, what this is all about and you, you're, it's forefront in your mind. But it turns out, I think when they, the day they asked me what topic to talk about last, I don't know, a few weeks ago, um, I think I have four people on my, on my list uh, uh, for the day that all had ovarian cysts of one form or another. And I thought, boy, this is a... This is a message I'd like to get out uh, because I think a lot of people just assume, oh my gosh, I have a cyst, you know, I'm going to die. And 99.9% of the time, that's simply not true. You know, most of the time, these are normal physiological processes um, that you have to put into perspective. And, you know, that's what we're here for. I'm always happy to get people in and and, and check them out, go over these uh, radiology reports, get, you know, an ultrasound if we need one, um, and sort of figure out how to how to follow these things uh, moving forward. Um, but, you know, with that in mind, um, no, I think I think this is a great topic, and I'm glad to have the opportunity to get on the air and, and share it. Well, I know our listeners appreciate it as well, so thank you very All right. kindly. All right.